Okay, pause and stop recording. Sorry. Recording, there we go. If you're in business, okay. They tax you based on. Uh, okay, now what is this? Show me, I don't care. Why do we the get these things? Okay. So you don't okay. predict, right? There we go. Tax. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Meeting is called to order. Welcome to the October 2022 agenda. For those of you who don't know what year it is, third year of COVID, coming out of it, hopefully. Most of us are coming out of our minds, but that's the thing yet to be discussed, which we'll discuss later on in the, in the meeting, probably. Um, let's see, we have... Okay, let me tip this down here so I can see. I had my eyes dilated and I can't see doodly squat. On the smile. Okay, we got 13 participants out in the ozone land and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine here. Oh, I've got one in my pocket. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> my logistics guy back here. Uh, housekeeping, Q&A tabs, uh, if you have questions for us. Uh, and let's see, chat amongst yourselves in the chat tab. Next meeting will be Zoom and in person. Uh, we'll have a guest speaker from Mount Lemon talking about what they have going on there. Uh, I don't know which the person is yet. They haven't delegated that to some poor bastard, uh, but I'm sure that's coming. Next month, final month, to get your name in to run this uh, group of cats. So uh, today uh, you can nominate, you can volunteer, you can assign under duress, uh, press gang, kind of like I was, uh, into positions. Right now, Jack Jones has agreed to remain as treasurer. So that's one less position to uh, uh, have to fill. So we're looking at for a president. Uh, the duties pretty much are to run the meetings and to uh, place blame on other people on the board for things when they go bad. The vice president, the main duty of the vice president is when the president isn't around to run the meetings and to uh, help find guest speakers. Secretary takes notes, uh, maybe does correspondence as needed. And property master, we have some really ragtag uh, sandwich boards with our uh, informata on it uh, that we put out for the various events when we have them, as well as some pop-ups, which are in dire need of uh, repair. Past that, All Arizona Star Party, uh, October the 21st and 22nd, that's Saturday and Sunday, or Friday and Saturday nights, uh, portalettes will be set Thursday, so the, you don't have to hold your water. Uh, you can uh, go out there a night early, and from what I'm seeing of uh, the weather forecast, uh, the Blythe forecast is uh, basically clear and light winds. Uh, ideal temperatures, low of 65, so that you couldn't get much better than that, other than... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yes. I just checked the salon weather. Uh, this evening uh -huh. and Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are supposed to be good. Okay, we've got a, a Salome weather forecast. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are supposed to be good. So I'm going to be out there, uh, but I will have my uh, contingent of beer just in case I have to set out a, ni a night of clouds. Are they going to be able to get the truck with the portable toilets, ground those washes? Oh, yeah, we did it for the Messier Marathon, same location. Yeah, they know where it's at. and. Uh, well, there is a well, there is a long way around in case you can. Yeah, I tried that, and I don't want to go that route. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a long, long. I haven't tried it. The, the actually, the guy that uh, sets those portalettes routinely drives that road past the antenna site because down that road there's uh, our site or something. Yeah, there's, there's a substation down there that uh, he has to deliver stuff to. So, anyway, be there, be square. You might want to make a comment about it's it's an evac event and if everything goes smoothly they are tentatively looking at a chili dinner for saturday night yes i yes, think it's so like a five dollar for a bowl of chili. 
and buy your buy your ticket at the at the serving. Yes, and supposedly there will be a um, uh, a raffle, uh, and normally ahead of uh, all of that is a uh, swap meet. So uh, no telling what will be out there. Not sure how many will be out there, but we're hoping to have a, a good crowd. I, I mean, like I said, I'll be out there. We'll assist them in whatever we can, uh, such as such as it is normally. I have another question. Yes, Paul. The next SAC meeting in only three weeks? Yes, the next SAC meeting is on the 4th of November because the following Friday is Veterans Day. Um, we have an outreach event uh, requested of us at the Bella Vita Care Facility one evening, maybe the last week of this month or sometime the first week of November. Just a couple telescopes out there, uh, ones that we can get low enough that the people in wheelchairs can use. Uh, there is light pollution. You can't see the rest of this picture, but these are fire trucks and ambulances that sometimes pull up while you're trying to show people things. So we, we presented on this before. Steve and I have been out there. One of our former members, uh, William King, Bill King, has got a 10-inch job out there that we've been working on and he is just excited as hell to uh, be able to uh, to see things now. Uh, Glenn gave us some solar uh, filter uh, film and we made him a, uh, uh, made Bill a, a solar filter. So he goes out and he looks at the sun. Uh, he's, he's just excited, just really excited. Now I did look at an articulated eyepiece that um, will, one of the guys at uh, this next event that I'll tell you about was talking about, but it, it turns out they're eight pounds. They're more for professional uh, observatories and they cost $16,000. So I said, maybe not. Okay, so anybody interested, uh, let me know. We'll set something else up. We only need a couple of telescopes out there probably. Last month I got the address wrong for this uh, Monte Vista Elementary School. I thought it was the one that was on like 32nd Street in Osborne or something like this. It's actually on Ray Road. I've been there before, have a bunch of, uh, they're hoping for about 300 kids. You got a real nice area to set up, fairly dark. Um, it's It was pretty neat last time. We had some people from ASU even show up with telescopes. So uh, uh, anybody interested in this? This is a Saturday, uh, so uh, if you want to go send me an email and I'll put you on the list because they'd like to know who all is showing up. And then for you, uh, variable star observers, this is coming up uh, that same weekend of this uh, outreach, uh, November the 4th through 7th in Tucson. So just a uh, heads up for variable star observers. And then the thing that Steve and I attended was the, um, oh, for a second, we were thinking of going up here to see if this would be a good place for our next Messier Marathon. And we may have an opportunity to check out, uh, this is kind of nebulous. Ken Millward uh, told me about this, that there uh, is either the East Verde Valley Club was going to do this uh, Alamo Lake outreach for them, but it turns out supposedly uh, that club is now defunct. So I don't know how they set it up and then went defunct that quick, I guess, you never know. So anyway, we, we may assist in that if it's still going to be had. Uh, some of us go up there uh, looking for anything, any reason under dark sky is the way I see it. So. in the proper campground, which ATVers with their land trailers all around me, you know, it's still heads and tails about me. Even halfway to the airstreams. How do you get out there? You go to Winden and you turn Winden. <laughs> okay, you take the back road from Wickenburg. Uh, like you're going to Fort Site on the back road. And it's a real nice road. And then you get to Wyndon, you turn north, you go up past the Del Monte, I think it's Del Monte uh, fields where they grow their green beans or whatever. You take go up over the mountain and then down into a valley. So it's real easy to get to. Uh, so anyway, if you're interested in this, uh, let us know. Uh, this is something that's just, just in the works, just to, as a heads up, we might 
be able to get out for some more dark sky. Uh, let's see, then past that, Grand Canyon uh, uh, Conservancy let us know that they are looking for another astronomer in residence. They have three different positions for 2023. Uh, go onto their site. Uh, if you're interested, uh, check it out. They give you a stipend. You live up there in one of their cabins uh, for a few months, and it's like, I mean, that, that can be cool unless you got familial ob, uh, obligations you, you can't avoid. And maybe if you do have familial ob, obligations, that would be a great way to avoid it. So, Steve and I, um, a couple of weeks ago, we went to the David H. Levy, Comet Hunter, uh, all Arizona Star Party put on by Explorer Scientific down at Oracle Park. Uh, they're an actual uh, dark sky certified park uh, at Oracle. And this is this is driving in. You can see that mm, roads are wet because uh, it rained as we're going in. And it was supposed to be possibly rainy that night. And uh, Rick Road Trammell's on board with us. Good to see you, Rick. So we did have rain that night. And one of the things about it is you've got this rolling topography with manzanita and uh, all sorts of shrubs, no real good setup locations. The one little spot that they had for uh, everybody supposedly to get together, uh, my God, was smaller than the room that we're in right now. Uh, I mean, just in the half of the room that we're in right now. Uh, the guest speakers had a, a number of guest speakers. Uh, Scott Roberts, who runs Explore Scientific, uh, led it all. This was live streamed. David Levy was unfortunately at a um, um, hospice. His wife was in hospice. So he was there and he he zoomed in and uh, we he welcomed us. Uh, Wednesday, I, I didn't make this this first thing. Uh, I, I didn't see it on the, the schedule. I actually didn't see the schedule. Uh, then Thursday, uh, when we did start having talks, uh, again, David uh, Levy did provide, again, an open air and a welcoming. Then we started having some really good speakers. Speak Dr. John Barentine uh, talked about under ancient skies and talked about uh, the skies at the time and how uh, ancient peoples were stargazing and the evidence of that. Uh, Mike uh, Wiesner, uh, a guy from down there, uh, has worked on the shuttle space program, uh, talked about cell phone astrophotography, and it's like, wow, okay, uh, but he does some pretty interesting stuff with it. So uh, Connie Walker talked about light pollution from satellites, uh, very good talk. Chris Walker, uh, and he was talking about did I spell Antarctica wrong? I guess, yes. Um, he talked about uh, uh, astrophotography from Antarctica. We actually had one of the people from uh, ASU uh, who talked about launching balloons from down there and the same, the same project. Then uh, Dr. Stephen Edberg talked about solar viewing tips. Adam Block, uh, the human equation in outreach, it was a real good talk about outreach and how to make your outreach better. He's the one that talked about the articulated eyepiece for handicapped individuals. So I, I'm going to try to contact him to find out, where did you find an inexpensive one? So my, my Google search hasn't been that, that good. Friday afternoon speakers, Fred Espinac, Solar Eclipses, uh, Astronomy Magazine, David Eicher zoomed in, talked about galaxies. And Brandon uh, Hamill, the traveling astronomer, talked about the various places he's been uh, and the various telescopes he's looked through. Uh, and then th that particular uh, Saturday evening, he actually showed up at Steve's and my uh, telescopes and we talked at length uh, about what we were seeing. So uh, you can see the, uh, the weather Wednesday evening. Uh, cloudy, and, but it was supposed to be broken clouds and maybe some sucker holes. No, it rained. Let's see. Then Thursday, again, uh, cloudy with a chance of rain, and the chance became 100%, and it rained like bejesus. But at 5 a.m., if you can see it off on the right, uh, that dark 
photo is a cell photo picture I took when I was getting up to, how shall we say, uh, see a man about horse. And I uh, got a good shot of Orion, fairly stable, just with a uh, cell phone. Friday evening, again, was supposed to have partly cloudy skies. And this is looking to the north. Oh, let's see, that's the north, northwest. And this, there was this storm over on the west. And it was like, wow, not a problem. It'll miss us and it'll get clear. Man, it rained and it lightning and it stormed. Probably one of the, the worst storms we had. And then Saturday evening, it did clear up. And this is Steve uh, looking off into the uh, at Jupiter. Uh, this was a time exposure I did of, of his setup. And uh, pretty clear skies, a little moist. What well, weren't the best viewing uh, conditions? My light meter only it never did make it past uh, 21.3. So it wasn't that dark. Um, but some of the stuff I shot, this is looking towards the Tucson light dome, a little bit of Milky Way. Uh, looking the other way, uh, <laughs> I think there were clouds. Um, this, this almost, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Neptune right here. Uh, this just, these are just some of the things I shot, just random dumbbell nebula. And this is all with my, uh, Canon T7i, 30 second exposures, something around that. Uh, my ISO almost maxed out. For those of you who can see it on your computers, you'll see, you can see a lot of uh, noise in these. Bode's Nebula, M31 and 32, Pinwheel Galaxy, doesn't show up on our screen very well. But these are, ju these are just simple uh, DSLR shots, pretty quick, no stacking. I did a number of, um, open clusters, ring nebula. And you can see that if you look closely at uh, some of my stars are a little elongated. Helix nebula shooting into the Tucson light dome. Yeah, Tucson does get bright down there. Uh, Sculptor galaxy, and that's it. So that's all we did for the most part. Let's see if I can get rid of this now. I was wondering how uh, how the blow from Tucson was. It, it was substantial if you were shooting in it for any length of time, any anything more than 10 seconds, and it would glow pretty good. You would you'd need a light pollution filter on it for sure. And I wasn't, I didn't put one on. I could have and probably done a lot better, but. <laughs> yeah, shooting into the Phoenix light dome is, a, is much worse. Okay, let me see if I can do this without screwing things up totally. Did you take all those photos on Saturday right here? Yeah, I took all the photos uh, that I showed on Saturday. These are from Saturday night, yeah. Yeah, we, we did what we could. Okay, that's good. Let's go back to... Uh, hey, Tom? Yes. These were all at the David Levy star party? Yes, these were all Saturday night um, shooting from where Steve and I were set up. Um, pretty pretty decent shooting, but uh, I was having scope problems as Steve was too. Uh, I don't know, uh, the, one of the, the problems we had was we were set up on camp pads uh, where they tent, where you would have a tent and they were pea gravel with sand and stuff. And I'm kind of cons uh, pretty sure that the weight of my scope slowly but surely was sinking and causing my alignment to go out. Uh, plus the fact that my CGX just glitches on occasion and just drives me crazy with that too. So uh, I, I, I was getting frustrated towards midnight and we, we quit and we were talking with uh, the traveling astronomer until about 1 a.m. But we had a good time anyway. Yeah, and they, they weren't things like nice or, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. It was that Navy thing that I, I learned from my daughter. Let's see. Okay, now let's see if I can get out of this. Okay, how do I get out of my, go ahead, stop, stop share. Would that ruin it? Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Uh, okay, there we go. Yeah, I'm still not learning this. You need a new president. 
and a vice president and a secretary and a property manager. So treasurer. No, we have a treasurer. Actually, Jack says he'll be the treasurer next year. He says he'll continue with it. So that's nice. Okay. So don't have to go through the craziness of dealing with the bank again to get people on board. So, um, Paul, did you want to mention what the ATM did? Come here and sit in, sit in the catbird seat. The next face you see will be Paul Lind. Ah. Well, Tuesday night we had the ATM, Amateur Telescope Making Meeting, and most of our regular attendees are either out of town or have COVID. So we ended up with two other people and myself. So that's why I don't have a slide show for you tonight, but maybe next month will be better. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm just saying, they probably just sat around and ate cookies. Yeah. Oh, oh, Paul, okay. It's been confirmed by Paul that all they did was sit around, talk, and eat cookies. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, no, 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 no. They, they never last that long. I've had some of those. Those are good cookies. Rick, is there anything you want to say? Yeah, can I have a head count in person? Uh, yes, we have a in person. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine, including me. Thank you. You bet. David, anything you'd like to say? Negative. We're clear. Okay. <laughs> prepare. Well, just prepare. Or beware, they say. Beware. Of, well, just beware. Well, I guess we can jump straight into our guest presenter tonight, our, our member, Paul Jorgensen. Uh, he's talking about a, a topic that I think is really cool. And I've, I talked about it uh, as part of my one of my talks at the Grand Canyon Star Party. And it is uh, using, uh, basic, basically looking at uh, radio signals uh, detection from uh, meteors when they happen. And so he's, he's got a really cool presentation and he's got some new toys that I'm probably going to have to invest in. And they don't seem to be that expensive either. Not like buying a new telescope, which my wife always complains every time I get a new one. Uh, not that she knows all about them. Anyway, so Paul, I will allow you to take over now, if you would introduce yourself and tell us all about but remember, we have a limited amount of time. Don comes about 6.30, so. Okay, well, we'll come down to about six hours. Not a problem. All right, uh, my name is Paul uh, Paul Jorgensen, and the uh, thing behind me, that's a uh, hand photo that I did from uh, Casper. Let's do the share here. There we go. So uh, the talk tonight is on uh, radio meteor detection, doing uh, backyard radio astronomy. We've lost audio. How's this? There you go. Echo, echo, echo. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, I'm Paul Jorgensen. Uh, KE7HR is my amateur radio call sign. Uh, probably more people know me by my call sign than by my name. So it's one of those things. Come on. So I've been an amateur astronomer uh, since childhood. I remember uh, sitting in the, uh, the branch of the apple tree in fourth grade, sketching the moon uh, for a science class. Uh, but I've been a radio amateur since the mid 1970s. Uh, this call sign KE7HR since 1986. And I do radio things from very low frequencies, VLF 
on through the microwave range. Uh, I do a lot of long range ionospheric communications and even do some moon bounce communications. Uh, I am one of the uh, co inventors on a patent on uh, through the earth wireless radio communications. So I do a little radio stuff. Uh, I do love chasing total solar eclipses. And uh, the ones of note are uh, in Libya, 2006, uh, Australia, out in the Coral Sea, and uh, the USA one from, uh, from Casper, Wyoming, Mexico upcoming. Uh, I have my reservations at Mazatlan. Guess where the best uh, lack of clouds is going to be? Coming ashore at Mazatlan. Uh, I also do lots of comet chasing, or, and I have, I have recently, but uh, uh, Comet West was basically my start in 1976. Um, Alley in 1986. I actually ran uh, between 85 and 86 during that Alley's operation. I was running an amateur radio net uh, in the Seattle area where I was living. So we would get people as the clouds would move through and we would get a break. We had a, a radio network and we would be talking about star hopping. Okay, find this bright thing, 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 thing. Oh, I can see it. I can see it. So people would jump around with their radios and and we helped uh, several hundred people actually see Halley at that point. So that was kind of fun. Uh, I also visited New Zealand and Tahiti to, uh, to see Halley. So that was fun. Uh, Hale Bop, lots of other uh, fun things. I built a barn door tracker for my photography, carried that down to uh, uh, New Zealand and Tahiti, uh, trying to align to the kind of empty space. Uh, down there in the southern hemisphere is a bit of a challenge, but uh, we made it work. All right, what's a meteor? Uh, meteoroids are objects in space that uh, range in size from dust grains to small asteroids. Think of them as little space rocks. They can be icy and fluffy or hard and rocky like iron nickel. When the meteoroids enter the atmosphere at high speed, they burn up. The fireballs or the shooting stars are called meteors. So here's a, a little graphic on some meteor terminology and a lot of these graphics are not mine. I unashamedly just took them from wherever I can find them uh, to try to get the, uh, the uh, ideas across. So you'll have uh, some things that we are saying as, uh, of course, a comet we all know is, is not a meteor or a meteorite. Uh, it's, it's not something that we're seeing in the sky. And I, I often get the, uh, the comment from people they talk about comets. Oh, those things that streak across the sky. Well, no, they're usually going fairly slowly, but. Uh, meteors as they enter will have the, the differences in the bright ones, a meteor, uh, a fireball, and a, and a boloid. Depends on your, your uh, definition of how all those things are, but those are the bright ones that we often see. And if it makes it all the way to the ground, it will become a meteorite. Uh, and of those that actually make it to the ground, uh, NASA says that 99.8% of them come from asteroids. So the, uh, the fluffy comet debris that enters the atmosphere, almost none of it makes it to the ground, uh, except as dust. So it's, it's ionizing and it's, it's uh, vaporizing it's in the upper atmosphere. The extreme high altitude clouds uh, use meteor smoke or dust as nuclei to condense around. So uh, not the lessened clouds, uh, some of those things that uh, we can see, especially uh, in the summer, uh, oftentimes is the, the condensing nucleus of the pieces left behind by all the stuff that enters the atmosphere. Some famous meteors, the Chicxulub at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, about the same as the, the time that the dinosaurs died out. I don't think they're exactly connected, but they're really close. Uh, meteor Crater, something that's up here in Arizona. It's about 50,000 years ago. Uh, the Tucson Ring. Uh, has anybody been to the uh, museum in, in uh, Washington, D.C. to see the Tucson Ring? It's a very famous meteor that uh, was uh, taken into the old Tucson Pueblo and it was used uh, when the Spaniards were down there, they used it as an anvil. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty famous meteor. ALH uh, 84001, uh, they believe it's a Mars rock and the uh, photo micrographs think that they might see some fossilized uh, microbes of some sort, interesting stuff. Uh, Tunguska, 1908. Uh, they didn't really find much of a crater, but they sure found a lot of stuff that was uh, was knocked over. Uh, the Chelyabinsk meteor in 2013. That's one of the recent ones that uh, uh, came down and uh, broke a lot of windows, rattled a lot of things. And interestingly enough, a lot of the people in Russia 
have these dash cams because they're uh, so prevalent of running into each other that they have to prove who, who is at fault. So a lot of dash cams were able to capture that. What happens as a meteor enters? Uh, so they interact with the atmosphere at uh, 20 plus kilometers per second. And the aerodynamic heating of the object produces a streak of light, both from the glowing object and the trail of glowing particles that it leaves in the wake. That trail can form a plasma in the ablation wake, and that can bend or refract radio waves. The meteor has to have a mass sufficient enough to make the ion trail dense enough to refract the radio wave. Uh, the estimates are that uh, from visual meteors that you can see, a shooting star, there's 10 times more radio uh, meteors that are there. So we can actually see the ionized trail uh, 10 times more than we can see the visuals. And the uh, estimates are that there's hundreds to thousands of tons of media material that enters the atmosphere every day. Depends on who you're reading. Um, the meteor trail altitude. Uh, meteor trails are generally confined to 75 to 100 kilometers above uh, the surface. Uh, some of the most energetic, the largest ones maybe, uh, start to ablate and create an ion trail as high as 125 kilometers. The length of the trail depends upon the mass of the object and the observer's geometric position with respect to the meteor. So is it going across your view? Is it coming towards you? Uh, going away, all of those things uh, make a difference. Here's a little graphic that shows something about radio meteors. In order to see a radio meteor reflection, the, the geometry of the transmitter, receiver, and the meteor must all fall into a fairly narrow window. So there's, there's going to be an arc of, uh, of an area where we're going to have coincident view between where the radio transmitter is beaming into and where we can actually get that uh, reflection. So this is a scale drawing here of uh, a 2,000 kilometer path. And it shows that uh, between that 80 and 100 kilometers that we have uh, a zone there, which is kind of, a, kind of an arc within the arc. Uh, the ionosphere uh, that we use as radio amateurs to bounce signals off or refract signals off is, is powered by the sun. So uh, we have these different regions. Uh, the lowest one being the D region, the next one up being the E region, F1 and F2, which we combine at night into just what they, they just normally just call that the F layer because the, the D and the E region often go to, uh, away. Um, the D region into the E region is where the meteors are, are actually burning up and becoming that shooting star and giving us the ion trail. Uh, a question I get sometimes is, why is the D region the lowest region? Well, when the scientists were finding out that we actually had ions in the ionosphere and were bouncing signals off them, they knew about the D region, but they didn't know if there was going to be anything lower. So instead of saying that that was going to be the A region, they called it the D region, just in case there was something below it. So uh, the A, B, and C region just aren't there. Uh, so we're looking at uh, places where the, where the meteors show up. Uh, as they're diving in here on that right graphic, you can see that we're in, in that uh, D and E layer of the ionosphere, which can, uh, especially during the summertime, we'll get that, uh, that E layer. Uh, something that happened uh, fairly recently was that uh, big volcanic eruption down in the South Pacific. And uh, the ionosphere was actually disturbed by the amount of material and the shock wave that came off of that, uh, that big eruption. Where do we get a signal? Uh, a digital video television transmitter carrier signal. Uh, the FCC transitioned all the, the TV stations to digital TV, which is called ATSC, in 2009. Uh, the old analog television stations in 2009 were all shut off. There's a couple of translators that are still out there, but uh, they're phasing those out as well. Uh, there is a couple of stations in Canada that are still broadcasting analog, and we will try to look at one of those here in a little bit. So this, uh, the pilot carrier is nominally 309, 440,000.559 hertz above the lower edge of the TV channel. Call it 309 uh, kilohertz. 
the carrier signal is higher in power than the rest of the video and audio signal. The way that this works is that this carrier frequency is here. Your TV receiver can see the carrier frequency. It locks onto that. It knows where that is at. It stays locked with that. And then it knows that it's in that passband and everything that is else in the passband is gonna be the digital information that it needs to look for. So here's a couple of graphics of uh, how the pilot carrier uh, amplitude is along with the rest of the TV band. So this is one TV channel, and we can see that that, that spike up there is the pilot or the carrier frequency that I'm actually tuned to. Here's some of the digital uh, television channels, uh, their, their channel number, their RF band limits, and uh, the pilot frequency. So I've highlighted here in, in blue channel two at uh, 54.31 and channel five at 76.31, so 309441.5, whatever, um, close enough. Uh, those two are interesting because uh, there's uh, people in Arizona that are actually using both of those. Uh, I'm using channel five and there's another chap down in, in portal and he's using channel two. And uh, well, I'll show you some of the reasons why here in, in a bit. Uh, and here's another one. So channel two, he's using uh, Las Vegas, which is uh, up in, uh, in Nevada, at 27.7 kilowatts of power on that carrier frequency. Uh, there's also one in Rapid City, South Dakota, but that's another direction. Uh, on channel five, well, let's go to channel four. Channel three, we don't have anything that's close enough at all. Channel four, uh, the ones in Los Angeles are, are blasting through all the time. You have to get it to the point where you can't receive the direct signal, but you're looking for only the refractive signal. And because I can receive the direct signal from LA all the time, it's useless because I, I can't tell when the meters are actually tuning in. So I started using channel five uh, because we have a really strong transmitter in Fredericksburg, Texas, uh, Hastings, Nebraska, and another one in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And they're all pretty much in the same direction, the kind of east. Uh, for us at this point from Phoenix here. So here's another one of this uh, uh, digital television. It's it's called an 8 VSB uh, vegetable side sig sideband signal. Uh, so the instantaneous is uh, a shot over here of the uh, in this right area where the black is. So that's an instantaneous and, and the bluish and over in this area over here, that's that's more of an average what the signal is. So the, the signals are bouncing up and down in this passband all the time. So they will get to this uh, this upper level, but the uh, the carrier frequency is, is always there. How far is the observation zone? Well, that depends upon uh, how far we are away from the uh, uh, from the transmitter and from the receiver. Uh, so the, you have this region of overlap that's in uh, at the layer where it's at. And it's actually that little red uh, area that we see here, uh, you can think of that as, as a fairly thick layer from about 75 to 100, maybe 125 uh, kilometers above the surface. So this drawing is definitely not the scale. Uh, your observation zone is a, is a proloid ellipsoid. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not just a circle, but it's, it's one of these arcs and we can, we can see different parts of the arc. Uh, and again, when you have a, a refraction, like a reflection on a mirror, uh, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So uh, all of those things are, are going to where we can actually see the signal. How much power, echo power do we see on a received signal? Uh, the echo power is proportional to lambda cubed. The duration is proportional to lambda squared. And the number of echoes is roughly proportional to lambda. Lambda is the, uh, the RF wavelength in meters. So the lower in frequency that we go, the uh, the longer that we would get a particular signal, and uh, the echo power would also be uh, a little bit higher at the lower lower frequencies. Uh, so my picking channel five as opposed to channel two, if we were looking at the same volume, I'm going to actually probably see shorter echoes uh, if we had co-located transmitters and we could actually change that. But they're in a kind of a fixed location, so are we. So it's, you have to deal with what you have. Uh, the maximum distance at the meteor trail height. So uh, there's a, a formula where you can uh, plug this information in 
And at, uh, at 80 kilometers above the surface, you're just over 2,000 kilometers away as the maximum that you can uh, have that transmitted. Uh, if we're all the way up to 125 kilometers above the Earth, that line shows that we're up to 2,500 kilometers between the transmitter and the receiver. So in that band uh, is where we have to be. And if we had uh, something that was entering uh, at 2,000 kilometers, uh, but it was entering at, at 125 kilometers, of course, we have a, a, a wider zone at that point to arc and sit through this. So here's the uh, uh, visual indicated uh, meteor distance for a, a selected meteor zenith angle. So if you have something that's directly overhead uh, with zero zenith angle, it's between 80 and 120 kilometers, like straight above you. Uh, as you go further and further down towards the horizon, uh, we'll get out here to 80 degrees, and we're looking at uh, 394 to 557 kilometers. So that's the, the half pack. So if we're at uh, 80 degrees and 550, let's call it 500 just to around numbers. We're looking, you can see it from a transmitter that's a thousand kilometers away. It can also see from 500, and we're at 500. So we have that, so we can double this visual range. So it's interesting that if you're looking at, at you're seeing a shooting star, a, a meteor that's actually near the horizon, it's, it's quite far away. You know, right at 90 degrees, if you've got a, a really good spot you're on top of the night hill, you don't have any of those scrub brush trees and things that you had down there at Oracle. Uh, you're maybe looking at something that could be a thousand kilometers away. So talk about the uh, forward scatter and backscatter. Um, backscatter is the classic implementation of a radar. Same transmit and receive location. The transmitter sends out a burst of radio energy then listens for the return between the bursts. Um, Forward scatter uses the distance over the horizon transmitter and a local receive station. So we have a separated transmitter and a separated receiver. And the, uh, I push the right button here, the transmitter and the receiver are on all the time. With a, 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 a radar or a forward scatter or a back scatter, you're looking at a pulse that goes out. So you're, you're missing some time in between. And the time for the pulse duration to come back. You can calculate speed of light uh, to see how far things are away. I use forward scatter for my experiments because I don't have the, uh, the capability to generate a really large uh, radar signal at this point, and I would have to do a lot more with the FCC for that. So uh, here's a, a graphic that shows the difference between the forward scatter and the back scatter. And uh, again, the, the forward scatter is what I'm using. So I use a, a, a non light of sight. Transmitter and receiver. Uh, here's a little bit about the geometry. The, the meteor enters uh, on a line, so it's, it's basically in a plane, but that plane is, is almost always inclined. Uh, and you still have to have the, uh, the coincident angle. So the, the angle between uh, the, the transmitter and the receiver uh, has to be equal. So it has to be ionized enough to be able to, to refract the signal that far. Uh, under dense and over dense. There's a couple of terms that uh, the radio meteor people use. And depending upon the circumstances of the meteor and its entry into the atmosphere, uh, the ionized trail may be under dense or over dense. An under dense trail may not have enough ionization to support refracting the signal back to the surface for more than just an instant. An over dense trail are sufficient for uh, refracting the signal back for longer times. So here's a, uh, a graphic that shows the difference. Here's an under dense on the left hand side, and here's the time scale. So this is, you know, about 1.2 seconds. This is about two tenths of a second, a quarter of a second, that the, the, the large part of that signal is here. And here's an over dense on the right hand side. And from one, we're looking at at least. Uh, seven seconds uh, that we're seeing on the over dense here. Uh, I will show you some that are much, much longer over dense uh, that I've received here at my home station about two miles from the front house here. Uh, the signal scattering. So this meteor trail is, is coming in and the transmitter is, is broadcasting all the time. Now it's not, 
the transmitter is not broadcasting in a narrow beam like this graphic shows. It's it's going omnidirectionally. So we're only seeing one uh, little part that's happening. So this graphic really shows only where that transmitted radio signal wave is intercepting the, the meteor ionized prey. And the reflected rays, uh, some of them are making it through and uh, aren't going to be refracted back to the Earth. And then some of them are going to be at the at the proper ionization, so we get the good refraction, and the uh, the signal comes back down to us. Uh, I found this interesting graphic uh, some time ago, and this was uh, uh, NASA blackout frequencies. And so for different temperatures of the uh, of the uh, the plasma as the capsules and rocket ships are coming back into the Earth, uh, where do they get that blackout? I so remember probably the, the uh, Apollo 13 where they had a long blackout because they actually were coming in a little hotter, a little, uh, a little steeper than they otherwise would. And that ionized trail was deep enough. As the ions uh, uh, were flowing around the capsule, it was actually blocking the signal uh, from being able to get direct to the ground. So it was refracting them off in a different direction. And that's how you get your radio blackout. And so this the plasma frequencies here, we're looking at at our our altitudes for the uh, for the uh, meteors between 80 and 125, we're looking at around uh, 3,000 to 3,300 Kelvin. So those meteors are burning up pretty warm. So what signals do I use? The the transmitted signal must not be received on a continuing basis uh, and be at a distance within the maximum path for the uh, the neutral visibility. So we have to have it far enough away that you don't see the, the signal all the time, but not so far that it can't bounce off the ionized trail and get back down to you. The, the DTB transmitters are in fixed locations. So we're stuck with where they're at. We can't actually get them to move and we can't get them to put a lot more stations up. I've done the search of the FCC uh, database and gone through the whole thing to try to figure out where they all are. The closer and relatively lower frequency would be better to get longer echo or, or ping times. Um, however, uh, there may be other things that you have to look at when you're uh, in your use of the, the situation. Uh, a directional antenna can be used to block possible interference off the back of the beam. We'll talk about some antennas here in just a second. This is the, uh, the channel frequencies that are set up. And again, I highlighted channel five and the distances and power outputs from uh, Hastings, Nebraska, Fredericksburg, Texas, are at 45 kilowatts, and the Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, at 48 kilowatts. Uh, if there is co-located or, or co-channel interference, they move the pilot signal slightly between the different stations, because if the E-layer actually gets active and they're getting this long path, uh, you're trying to listen to your local channel five in Texas. Well, what about the one in Nebraska? If that's getting an e-skip and you're actually getting another image, in the old days, we would consider that a ghost image and see that, that thing you adjust your rabbit ears so you preferentially treat the one signal better than the other. But the digital works with it a little bit differently. So they have that pilot signal that's just barely slightly offset. I may be seeing some of that in my, my things. We'll look at that here in just a minute. There may be another reason for uh, something, but uh, I believe that I'm definitely getting both the Hastings and the Fredericksburg and possibly also sometimes uh, the Fond du Lac in the very high altitude. So here's uh, my station here in Phoenix to the TV5 uh, stations that I was just talking about. Uh, so you see that we're well within the 2,500 kilometers all the way out to that Fond du Lac. So if something is entering at 125 kilometers uh, above the surface, uh, I should be able to see from that Fond du Lac uh, transmitter. And here's a, an aerial chart that shows a couple of the antennas. The one uh, on the left-hand side, there's the Hastings antenna. And the one on the right is the Fredericksburg, Texas antenna. Uh, that Fredericksburg, Texas antenna is uh, 1,149 feet above the ground, uh, which puts it at uh, 3,049 feet above sea level. So that's, that's actually a very nice altitude as well. Now, if we uh, shorten our way down to uh, 2,000 kilometers, uh, we start losing that, uh, that uh, Fond du Lac station. So we're not going to be able to see that anymore. 
And remember at 2000 kilometers, we were seeing things uh, that were entering at about 80 kilometers above the surface. So inside that, that 2000 uh, kilometer radius or 80, uh, 80 above the surface, we see both of those stations at Hastings and Fredericksburg. Uh, Hastings at uh, 1300, uh, 1434 kilometers and Fredericksburg at just about 1300 kilometers. So we're well within the 2000 kilometer range there. So we're actually seeing a bit more volume at that point because the, the, we're close enough that their angle, uh, the, the tangent to the surface is actually uh, at a good angle for me here at Phoenix. Equipment for the reception. How do we actually see these signals? Uh, I use inexpensive RTL SDR, uh, which are originally built for foreign uh, digital television broadcasts. Uh, they don't work for digital television broadcast in the U.S., um, but there were some very clever people that saw these as a nice little radio, and they made it into a wideband receiver for all all different kinds of, of signals. Uh, so they, they took this thing, which was uh, built to receive digital signals uh, for TV, mostly in Asia, and they said, oh, look at that. If we bypass this little bit of code in here and read it, rewrite this thing. Uh, I'll have pictures of it here on the, on the screen in just a second. Uh, we can actually get this thing to receive from about 25 or 30 megahertz to 1.7 gigahertz. So interesting little things. Uh, the high accuracy types have a temperature compensated crystal oscillator. And that can be uh, very critical to understand which exact station that you're listening to. Uh, SDR means software defined radio. And that means that the radio is usually more software than it is hardware. You, you can see that this thing, which is a very uh, small little device that plugs into a USB on your computer, uh, has a very large range. So most of the filtering and all of that stuff is being done inside this little tiny little box with software. So here's what it looks like. This is a, a recent eBay um, screenshot. And uh, this is one of the ones that I have here. It's a NESDR smart, and it also has the 0.5 ppm uh, temperature compensated uh, crystal oscillator. So it's, it's fairly stable. Once it gets up to its warm temperature, uh, it doesn't have any drip, uh, very, very low in drift. And you're looking at uh, eBay shipped to your house for $36, plus a few pennies in tax you have to pay the state. Uh, there's other expensive, more expensive options than $36. Uh, the AirSpy SDR is one. I have one of them set up. We'll actually be able to, to look at some of those things uh, locally here uh, tonight. Uh, there's commercial wideband radios that are out there that range in the uh, hundreds, high hundreds to many thousands of dollars in the commercial radios. There's another software defined radio that's called the USRP. Uh, you're looking at about three to four thousand dollars for each one of those. Some guys are doing very interesting work with those. Uh, Hack RF, and there's dozens and dozens of others, but that's uh, a little thing. You're going to need a computer. The computer uh, is probably going to be the most expensive part of your system, but you probably already have a computer. Uh, and I use both Windows and, and Linux computers. Uh, you need some software to receive the signal. You need it to be able to talk to the SDR and then translate that information back down onto something you can use. Uh, there's many free to use software radio interfaces. Uh, depends on the operating system. Uh, I use a thing called SDR Sharp as my main interface uh, on the Windows machine. Uh, I use GQRX and others on Linux. Uh, almost all of the Linux stuff that I'm using on uh, Ubuntu, especially, uh, they're not quite as developed and they don't have all of the, the features that I have on SDR Sharp. Uh, both operating systems uh, sometimes take a little tap dancing to uh, get all the install requirements to be correct so that the machine reads the SD or the software defined radio properly and then can pass that information off to the, uh, to the software program where it can actually, you can do some useful things with it. We need an antenna to be able to receive as well. Uh, the antenna should be resonant or tuned to the specific frequency uh, that you're going to be receiving on. Uh, most wideband antennas are poor at all frequencies. Yep, we can do a lot of wide stuff, but they're not really good at any one frequency. A beam antenna can add uh, gain in a preferred direction and block signals from the rear or behind that antenna. 
uh, and we need a mask to mount it on. So the antenna that I like a lot and I, I use in several different uh, things besides just meteor detection is called a Moxon antenna. And it's, it's based on the work from the 1950s by a chap named Les Moxon. Uh, he was working on uh, folded dipole antennas and trying to make things that were a little bit smaller than a full size uh, half wave antenna. And, and this is a folded two element beam and it has very good front to back ratio and a wide capture area. So it's, it's actually fairly ideal for uh, pointing off in the direction that I do on channel five. It's easy to construct uh, from simple house wire or from copper tubing, and it works great. Here is the, uh, the uh, antenna pattern for a TB5 Moxon that I have put together. So this is um, the work that I did to be able to see where, where it's at. Uh, the, the thing on the left here is a 3D slice, and the, the red is the, uh, the vertical slice. I have the antenna oriented so that the antenna itself is vertical. So we have vertical polarity, uh, and that allows then a wide beam width uh, across the horizon. So we're not trying to compress on the horizon itself, but we're, uh, we're fairly good. When you get right to the, the very top, right above, so at, at uh, the Z above, at the zenith, uh, you're not going to receive very much signal there at all. Uh, but we're interested more of the, the information, the signals that are coming from closer to the horizon. And here's a, a couple of photos of the antenna in my backyard. Um, one was uh, taken at night with a cell phone camera because the Phoenix glow and the, and the clouds were just really nice that night so you could see it. Uh, there's a little uh, uh, black circle in the middle there. And I, I take the coax, uh, which uh, the feed point is, is at this point on the antenna. And so the signals are coming from this direction. And then this is uh, acts as a reflector on the back side. So it's, it's blocking the signals from behind and allowing uh, the signals from the front to actually have some gain. And this uh, this piece of coax runs from here back to the mast, and then I put it in a little circle. It's, uh, it's called an antenna choke, and it decouples the feed line from the antenna itself. So it doesn't have the feed line uh, interacting with the antenna itself. So let's get to some received signal. Uh, so this is a, uh, a picture of, of SDR sharp. And you see that we're dialed into 76.308411 megahertz. And here's uh, the uh, indication on the, uh, the FFT up above here. And this is the waterfall signal down below. And I've circled in red here, there's a couple of meteors. So this, this small one here, uh, it's a one little ping. And that was uh, more than likely an underdense meteor. Or it was at a different angle where we only saw the underdense part. Uh, and you see the one down below here uh, is, is uh, much longer in time. And so that's either an overdense meteor or we had a, a really preferred direction uh, for that particular one. What is the vertical scale? Uh, the vertical scale, um, uh, the upper part here is actually a power scale, so it's an FFT power. And in the, in the lower area, it's called a waterfall. So the waterfall uh, takes an instantaneous read of whatever the FFT is doing and then it increments it down. And I have this particular one set uh, that's at about a minute for the waterfall. So those two entries happen there uh, in less than a minute. So talk about the FFT and the waterfall. So the, the FFT is that wiggly line that displays and that's the received power. And the second section is the waterfall and it summarizes that instantaneous FFT signal. And we are allowed to see that for a longer time. And the waterfall time is adjustable by several parameters. You have a longer time to integrate more signals. Uh, most of the things that I'll be showing you tonight have a three minute integration on, on the waterfall. And I have a timestamp on there so we're able to actually uh, see what's going on at what time. Uh, in order to get the, uh, the pictures, because I don't, have, I don't want to sit there at my computer 24 hours a day and go, that's a good one, that's a good one. I have some screenshot software, and uh, I use that screenshot software to take a picture every two minutes. I have three minutes on the waterfall, and I have a two-minute screenshot, so I have continuous overlap uh, along the uh, the whole time that I'm observing. 
And then it's easy later to go through the images very quickly. And I go, I like that one, I like that. And then I can copy those off to a, a preferred directory and be able to, to watch those. So as long as the computer is powered on and the radio is connected, the observatory is active. So here's some more pings. Uh, and, and you see this one is, uh, is probably another one of those over dense ones. And there's looks like there's two signals right next to each other uh, because it's fairly fat. And up above here, it trails off, and you'll see that there it's, uh, it's one little point as it gets further off. Um, so that's a, that's a fairly interesting one. Here's another overdense. Uh, so this was, uh, uh, so that's 5729 through 5753. Uh, so that's, that's about 15, 17 seconds uh, that the TV5 signal was refracted back all the way back here to Phoenix. Here's another one that was uh, was very intense but short. Uh, these that are are that intense but short in time, I'm interpreting right now that they're probably at one of those non-preferred angles. So I, I'm seeing a very dense and, and, and a long signal and a very high power signal from that, but it's it's fairly short in duration. Here's one that uh, that pinged off, and and there it goes for uh, for a couple of minutes. So that uh, that was a kind of fun one. Here's another one that uh, is is blending into. It looks like possibly two of those transmitter stations because the, the signal is so wide. The other possibility that could be happening with that is that I'm seeing that the main uh, the pilot signal, which is the the big signal, and the other part is possibly uh, this. A digital information that's, that's sending the picture and, and the audio to your TV station, to your TV set. Um, but it seems like a lot there. Here's a couple that uh, entered just a, a, a short time apart. Uh, some of these seem to, to come in little groups like this, and they probably are gravitationally um, tied together, little streams. Here's a good one, and you can see a really good separation there between. Uh, the, the two frequencies. So we had a really good one at the start and then it got to the other. So I'm interpreting this uh, so far. My, my original hypothesis is, is that it streaked across to the point where we got to the other, uh, other transmitter. So it was a long enough uh, entry. Here's another one that, uh, that really had a, a great double ping and it's hard to tell if it's two that entered almost simultaneously, or if it was one that was coming in and then split because uh, the signal gets very wide there. Here's another good long one. And here's a couple of other things that are happening uh, nearly simultaneously on two frequencies. Another really wide one here that uh, was entering. Uh, very vigorous, uh, very high power on, on that little spot there for about, what, five seconds, seven seconds? Uh, I believe that for sure is the, the digital um, television signal. I'm, we're looking here, uh, this area across is um, 3,000 hertz, so three kilohertz watt. A television uh, signal six megahertz wide, so we're only looking at a very small portion of that. Uh, and I'm trying to concentrate on that that pilot signal because that pilot signal is a single tone, single frequency. Uh, so what I'm thinking that I'm seeing here is that uh, this one was energetic enough, and it lasted long enough that that low level uh, changing frequency or, or changing amplitude signal. I've actually seen that. Question for you. Sir. Now, have you seen in the field uh, and recorded at the same time what you've seen? No. To compare? Okay. No, almost, almost, well, I've done a lot of these overnight. Uh, this particular one happened at 11.35 p.m. Uh, and this was on 9.30 and, or 9.20, September 20th. Uh, and I think if we look back, we'll find that it was cloudy. <laughs> so 
uh, here, here is the observatory working while you can't see the above the cloud. I muted again. Let me know. Okay. Here's another one, and I, I, I'm also seeing a little signal over here. I don't know if you can see that trail uh, on your home computers. It's a little bit dim up here. Uh, this is an artifact in the receiver itself. So it's uh, when when we have uh, other strong signals because uh, these these little devices are so wide band. Uh, every so often, the oscillator uh, is looking at things that are multiples higher than where you're at, and so we're seeing one of those sub multiples, and it's providing a little bit of a of a carrier signal, a birdie that we we be listening to. Uh, got a question here. Can you detect a Doppler shift if the meteor is moving towards you, away from you, across track? As a single station, no. If we have a group of stations and we are, are doing it simultaneously, we can look at the time and then we can look at uh, the frequency. The, uh, the, the frequency is, is a fixed frequency because the transmitter is there, uh, because we're using a fixed frequency. Um, if, if something was moving across, uh, um, several years ago we had a thing in the United States that was called the uh, the space force, something or other, and it wasn't quite the space force. Uh, colloquially, it was called the space fence, but now they've made another thing called the space fence, and it was a fixed frequency. We actually had one of the big transmitters down here, uh, just south uh, in the Maricopa area. Uh, and if you drove south of the, uh, the, the uh, Firebird Lake on your way to Maricopa, uh, there was a, a big fence and a, and a trench, it looked like, on the right hand side. That was a big linear array antenna that was broadcasting on 220 approximately megahertz. And there was one here, there was another one uh, further east and another one further east. They had receivers that were interspersed, California, New Mexico, and all the way out across. And what they were looking for then was, uh, because they had uh, a fixed beam and fixed receivers, but receivers that were widely separated, they could tell that how the, uh, the satellite was actually moving. So it was, it had this narrow beam that was broadcasting up into the sky and they could actually watch it as it crossed the beam. You, I had some receiving things where I could look at and you'd watch the things go by. And because I could listen to the local one, which is down here, I could actually see the airplanes fly through. <laughs> so you could actually watch the Doppler happen. Got another question. Is your receiver uh, broadband enough to see several channels Yes, it is, but but the noise is awful, and you, you have a hard time telling the difference between the noise and the not noise. Uh, also, the uh, the antenna is is fairly well tuned, and so you're not going to be able to receive across multiple channels at the same time. So here we back up. So this uh, you're actually seeing the uh, the receive power on the uh, on the FFT, and you see that it's all. A nice build in and it's showing this red color. Uh, so I have uh, the waterfall adjusted so that uh, it shows the red colors here uh, when you get to the high powers. And this is the next frame after that. So this is what was happening during that high power uh, about two minutes early. And on this one, it's, it's difficult to see on the screen locally here, but I, I'm seeing three traces. And I think this is one of the ones. Uh, so I have the, the big long one here. I have the next one here, which is fairly long. And then I have a little short one on this one here. And there's about 15 or 20 little uh, pixels there on that side. So I'm, I'm, I think at this point, I'm actually seeing all three of the, uh, of the TV5 transmitters out to 2,500 kilometers. So I think this was a fairly high altitude uh, and it entered are coincident zones of observation. So it was long enough to be able to do that and high enough at the same time. We all, some of the things don't actually uh, fully enter. They, they may be uh, earth grazers. So they're gonna come by, you know, burn up for a while and they'll skip off and go back out. Uh, we're also looking at, at uh, the Fresnel zones. 
Uh, and that may be responsible for that varying signal strength that we've seen on a couple of these uh, these screenshots. Uh, the uh, the radio has uh, constructive and destructive uh, parts of, of the wave as it's coming down. So we're, we're looking at various uh, angles as it as it's happening. We have another thing here that's uh, that can happen. And here we have the lower half of the screen. You see it's all got snowy colors on it, and that's that was radio noise. Something was going on, and this was at uh, 1.56 in the morning. So something had switched on in that preferential direction. Uh, I don't think we have any fence timers here, but touch lamps are horrible RF generators. Um, you know, like we have light pollution, radio people have uh, radio pollution, we have noise pollution, RFI. Uh, well, what if you don't want to do any of this? Uh, by yourself, but you're still somewhat interested in doing it. You can go to livemeteors.com. Uh, there's a, a group of guys that have uh, have set up a, a, an online station, and they are in the, the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, they have tuned to the, uh, the Channel 2 frequency, uh, which is still broadcasting from Canada as an AM signal, as an only amplitude modulated signal. And this is a screenshot that I took. Uh, this was on 9:26 of 22. Uh, other information: the International Meteor Organization and the IMO has a radio section. So if you're interested, you can look at some of their stuff. They have some very interesting things there. Uh, Meteor News also has uh, some interesting things. So you can uh, look at different sites, sorts of information that they have. A lot of it is towards the visual and for the, the guys that are running uh, video and long-term uh, visual observations. And they're trying to correlate some of those things. Um, the American Meteor Society and the radio observing area, they have lots of interesting things about the radio meteor scatter. Uh, there's a guy over in New Mexico, uh, Stan, that he's been involved in this sort of thing for a long time. He was using the space fence it was in Arizona and also in Texas back when I was doing it at the same time 15, 20 years ago. Uh, it's a big rabbit hole. <laughs> Jump in. So we can go for some more questions. Yeah, so you're, you're receiving mainland channel five, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. Seems to me you can't have a station transmitting channel five anywhere. That's correct. Central. Like, yep. Yep. And, and be off. Yeah, it has to be somebody that's that's over the horizon from you, uh, and you're not getting the direct signal. Uh, the, the transmitters in LA uh, are up on the top of the mountain, and uh, those trans because they're trying to cover the whole LA basin, right, and, and without the little, uh, problems with the digital TV where they're having issues with shadowing and faking and things like that. Um, and because they're so high up. Uh, I can actually see their signal all the time from my app on channel four. I thought, well, that'd be great. We're at a good distance and we could see, you know, a, a really large column of that. No, I, I see that signal as a as a solid line all the time. So they have a way of energy you're trying to do. You can't you can't tell the signal in the answer is it's already there. Uh, the other thing that could be possibly also uh, happening with that is that uh, Maybe possible if you have a really good directional antenna would be to point the other way and get some backscatter on. So you're using them as uh, not quite like a false radar, but you're using them as a backscatter. Haven't tried it yet. More experiments to have an answer. So we we'll have a comment and a question. And the comment is that we're talking about the massive blackout, that they were either with shepherds or a lens first mission. They were. Yeah, they couldn't figure it out. Yeah, uh, so it was, there's a minor panic going on. Uh -huh. The second one, uh, uh, how long the duration of these when, when something we have the the eyes is problem when they last? Well, uh, the the screenshots that I was showing you here, we had things that were you know the under dense paintings. I didn't show a lot of those because they look like one little dot on the screen. I like to. Ones that look a little bit more interesting on the screen. So, let's say over dense. so, so the, the under dense ones are a, a, a second or less, a quarter of a second. Uh, the over dense ones, uh, I, we saw this one here that went for almost two full minutes. Okay. 
the reason I asked the question is I grew up in Southern Arizona. Mm -hmm. So we had the free spaces from two stop, which uh, I think the channel four, I and 13. Mm -hmm. And I must have been channel four. I remember one time we picked up a station from somewhere in the south. Right. And that might have been. Uh, it's possible. If it was during the middle of the summer, uh, I, remember the time I just remember yeah. like we found a signal that we never saw again, but we just saw this. Yep. TV station coming from the south. Yep. Uh, that during the summertime, during uh, high uh, sun output times, we're, we're, so when we're at the peak of the solar cycle, uh, we have lots of sunspots and we're getting, you know, CMEs and all that other stuff is, is uh, putting stuff into the ionosphere. And it, it's uh, ionized the things quite a lot. Uh, we can energize that that E layer, and that E layer can get energized enough where that you can see those signals from really long distance. Um, uh, we're looking, we're talking about single hops here. Right. Uh, uh, really strong stuff. Uh, you can get multiple hops. Uh, we do it all the time as amateur radio people. Uh, I talk to Australia with with a five watt radio. Well, there's no way that even on the F layer that we're bouncing. Uh, all that direction, we're having to go multiple hops to be able to get all that far down. So, not quite antipodal, but uh, it's, it's hard from Phoenix because that's just a piece of the ocean down there. You can't quite get there. Yes, um, do you see the frequency of multiple meteors increase? Does it uh, correlate with like the visual meteor showers? Yes. With that during the first year? Sure. All over the place? Yep, should be a lot. Got another question here. Uh, would I be able to see as much with the 36 uh, eBay receiver as you're seeing with your uh, AirSpot receiver? Uh, yes. The, uh, the AirSpot is a little bit more sensitive. Uh, the other things that, that I, I will probably do to upgrade my station in the future is to build a frequency specific uh, filter so that I'm, I'm taking all the other garbage that's in, the, in the, uh, the world out there and not receiving that at the same time. So I'm going to cut that down by 30 to 50 dB. And so I'm really only receiving the one. And if, when I do that, I might actually put further amplification on it. Uh, but an amplifier alone amplifies both the signal and the noise. So if you don't do the filtering first, uh, you're only amplifying all of the garbage that's coming in at the same time. So, all of the possible images that you're seeing. The, the SDR Sharp uh, works very well with the uh, RTL SDR devices, and uh, we use those all the time. I, I use uh, the RTL SDR devices to do uh, the balloon tracking. And we're going to run the full range uh, from the Phoenix location here, the track tracking balloons uh, that are going all the way down into, uh, into Mexico. See the balloons over in California, we see the balloons up uh, north of Flagstaff. Las Vegas. Uh, so those are 300 kilometers or so away when the balloons are up at uh, 100,000 feet, maybe 6,000 meters. Cool. Uh, so the, the, the devices are sensitive enough. You just have to know the limitations and trying to receive a long time that I really want to go with a, uh, a resonant antenna and probably a filter as well. Is there uh, any advantage to being at a higher altitude? Sure. Uh, you're looking uh, when, when we move back to that chart that looks at uh, the angle that you're actually seeing. So we're, we're seeing. Oh, uh, repeat the question. Uh, uh, is it any? Is there any worthwhile to be able to go at a higher altitude when we have a clearer view, like mountaintop or something like that? Uh, it's possible because we're looking at. Uh, down to the horizon. So the further we can see out to the horizon with less things on the horizon, we're seeing those meteors that are, are uh, entering at that that range where we're going to be able to see those at the lower altitudes. But would that also not cause more interference if you have a strong station behind you that you're... Yeah, a strong station, yeah. You want to keep the mountain between you and the station behind yeah, you. Yeah, it's that whole juggling act. Yeah, yeah be on the face of the mountain, not on the side of the mountain. Sure, yeah, that would, that would really help. And I'm going to do some more experiments now with uh, uh, with the directional beam. And I'm going to try to go. There's uh, on Channel Five. There's a couple of stations up to the uh, the northwest. So there's one in the, just north of the Bay Area, and there's another one in I believe it was Oregon. I'll have to look at my list again. 
Uh, so what MBA tried to do is have uh, antennas pointed in two different directions with two different receivers uh, running points in that way. Yeah. Let's see if I can see those. But you're only looking at that one zone. So my zone and your zone uh, 100 miles away is going to be different. Is there a uh, favorable time of year or season where the detections work better? Or is no, it any time no, just any time. The radio doesn't care. So during one of the large, say, the Aronids or uh, a major meteor shower, it, that, that gets quite busy then. Sure. Yeah, it can, it can be very busy. Any other questions out there in the part, uh, participants arena? Okay. I've got a comment. Quite some years ago, I had a friend, a game operator, and they were actually making two-way communication from high-speed Morse code. Yes. And and I think there was some kind of contest to see if they could get you know a full two-way cell going. Yes. So they have, they have the amateurs have some very high-speed uh, burst communications. Uh, other burst communication systems that were out there and in use, they've been kind of supplanted now with Iridium and, and other satellite systems. Uh, but the snow tell, uh, the remote uh, snow depth uh, transmitters, uh, they would use burst communications. I'm sharing the screen right now on livemeters.com. So we're, we're now listening to the station in, uh, in the DC area, listening to the transmitter up in uh, Southern Canada. So we'll see if anything shows up in the water here. Now we not, might not be seeing or not, might not hear anything until we get a ping. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll see it in the waterfall. Yeah, but would we hear the ping? Uh, I don't know. We won't because it sounds out. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise we're getting feedback. I, I didn't have any headphones on. So, uh, but we'll see if anything shows up. But this is this is an easy way to get in there, and uh, it's, it's kind of amazing how it is. Uh, number of meteors, that's another question that I've had from other people before. And from my station at home where I have a good look to the east, we're we'll we'll blocked a little, block here, a little bit here and my own laptop will be down here. Turn it on here. But I'm seeing, uh, but I'm seeing uh, in, uh, September, in September, September where we're not, not really in the shower time. times, uh, a meteor just about every two minutes throughout the day. You get down to near uh, sunset, then it, it drops off a little bit. And it picks back up again a couple hours after so huh. that that's been my experience so far. Sir. Is it possible to get several people to set up and coordinate on this to use this to protect the beaver fall? Is it possible that we can set up uh, several people and coordinate them to, to look for a fall? Uh, possibly. We are really only looking at the uh, at the ionized trail. There is a way, and there's some guys uh, over in Europe. Got one? The little one? Yep, there's one. Falling down the waterfall. This waterfall is going fairly fast, so um, they they are doing that and trying to get coordinated stations with uh, uh, sub microsecond time, so they can actually uh, try to get a 3D representation as to where it was happening. Um, but the the possible uh, you can look at a bunch of those trails, but we don't know if it's a rocky thing that's entering and stops ionizing as it gets below the ionized, uh, below the heating layer, stops bending the light, or if it's one of the fluffy ones that just directly doesn't seize up and we never see it. So uh, it was interesting that uh, there was a fall in Texas about eight or 10 years ago, and uh, it was a clear day. But the NWS Doppler weather radar actually caught the meteor and the trail in pieces as they were coming in. Yeah. And, and the guys, the meteor guys went out and detected them and, and picked up some chunks. Cool. What's your uh, field of view? It's like, are you looking like a thousand miles across or 100 miles across? Well, it's an angle. So if, if I'm at 2,500 kilometers, or the highest ones at 2,000 kilometers, or some, something that's about uh, 80 kilometers above the surface. Uh, my antenna is looking at about 150 degrees wide. That antenna pattern thing that I was showing you, it's a fairly wide antenna for the capture range. Uh, so 
I can see easily uh, if I point at uh, in between Nebraska and Texas, I'm capturing both of those easily, and Nebraska and Wisconsin are just about in line. So thousands of miles of. Yeah, so I've, I've got a fairly big zone. Uh, now, if we have enough other people and we could create a dense network, uh, I, I thought about this otherwise. There's there's some space in the RF spectra that's not very well used, just below 50 megahertz. Um, military used to use it for some things, uh, Force Service used to use it for some things. Really uh, the old channel one was, well, the old channel one is actually the six meter amateur band. Uh, but below the six meter amateur band uh, is down, they used to have uh, cordless telephones in the 49 megahertz range, uh, children's band, uh, walking talking things. Uh, those were down there in the 49 megahertz. But just below that, it may be possible to, uh, if we had enough time and sufficient uh, gumption for everyone to be able to do it, we might be able to set up a series of stations. And then you have a series of receivers at the same time. And then you could probably start doing these, uh, know what the inflammation path was. And from there, you might be able to start uh, looking at things. You have to have and find a radio. Class would have to be synchronized. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's why you have to do your NTF uh, time or GPS synchronized clock. All of this. And then, of course, you know, sometimes the GPS synchronized clocks, there's scintillation that happens. Um, just like we get the situation when we're looking at the telescope at the eye, radio gets some people in as well. I mean, well so here, comes on. On. here comes another small one. There we go. There we go. For those of you on at home, well, just piss it here. Oh, there it is, down at the bottom. Well, we buffered for a second. Oh, okay. I was wondering, it's like, what did I do? If you had a bunch of occultation calls. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, it's a nice bright one there. Well, let's see if we can actually see some light. I'm going to stop this. Okay. For those of you not here, Paul has these antennas set up outside, and it's uh, uh, projecting the way he would at home towards the east. And uh, earlier in the evening, he had both the Washington, D.C. area system running uh, in the background, as well as his. Quite interesting. Another toy. <clears throat> so any other questions out there in participant land? Any questions about anything other than, uh, or any comments? Remember, you too can volunteer to be part of the SAC board. It's not too late. Let's hear from you. Looking for a president, <laughs> not one too big. Think of it as a Christmas present to the rest of your members or whatever particular spaghetti monster thing you believe in. So here's, uh, we're looking right now at uh, what this is receiving. So this is about 10 megahertz wide. And you see all of this noise hash that's going on. So. Oh, I'm sorry, we need to project, we need to project it up. Share. Share. Share screen. Or you people at home, man, nah, 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 nah. you're, you're not here. That's the problem with Zoom. You can't see everything all the we're, time. We're doing shadow puppets right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, here's a live look what we're seeing right now. And this is the air spy that's hooked up. And so we're looking at around a 10 megahertz chunk right now. So a little bit wider than what the TV signal is. Uh, is it between the red and the green line? This, or this, this red line up here, uh, okay. this, this is my where my VFO is set, my variable frequency oscillator. Okay. That's where my frequency is. So that's 76308. And we set my frequency about one kilohertz low from the actual pilot signal so that we hear a one kilohertz tone when it happens. Oh, okay. Because if we're set exactly the same frequency, it's called zero beat if you don't hear anything. So now we'll... Uh, uh, using the magic of the computer, we will zoom in. And there we are at uh, 3 kilohertz wide now instead of 10 megahertz wide. And we're still getting a little bit of noise. In the waterfall. In the waterfall. Okay. That's also in the FFT. 
Uh, now, if we get a signal, it should happen right about here. And I'm going to do that, which then uh, gives me a, a peak. Uh, the yellow line is now the peak of, uh, of the noise that's going across. And so if we get a, a, a detection, we'll see something. We're waiting for the clouds to clear. Oh no, the moon's out. What do we do? Got a question. How many online attendees did we have tonight? We had at one time 19. We're down a few from uh, now, but. Uh, as they get bored. <laughs> I don't care about that radio stuff. But it's meteors, things you can actually see. Is there anyone or any agency collecting this information? There's a couple of people that are, are collecting it. That uh, the guy over in Roswell, uh, they're, they're doing some things. He, I know my friend down in Portal that he's actually participating in their project. project. Haven't gotten there yet. Haven't gotten there yet. Uh, I, I, I doing this, this 20 years ago when the space sense thing was up, and I had new antennas where I could actually look at all sides of this and I started doing this again this summer. So, uh, you know, I was looking at something else, looking at something else, and just. You know, you start circling the drain, and there I went down the rabbit hole. And <laughs> Alice was waving to me and everything. But uh, so I, I started hooking things up. And I said, "Okay, well, I know it's not as good as it used to be with the old signals that we have and the old analog TV signals." But uh, I started working with these digitals, and I, I was very impressed with the kind of signals that I was getting. So I may do something more with him. Uh, there's there's been a, a waves of people that have tried to get a collection. What they're doing with that afterwards, I'm not sure it is. I was, I'm noticing that your yellow line uh, appears to, I mean, it, it was established earlier. That's a, that's a maximum of the signal. Yeah, of the, of the signal. Now, the uh, the signal that we're seeing in, in real time appears to be diminishing. Uh, no, no. It's not, it's, it's just. Yeah, the, we just haven't touched the top of it. Oh, okay. It just, it just seems like it before it, there was a lot more. I'll add a little more contrast to the uh, to the waterfall. And now starting to pick up a few little speckles on the waterfall. Now I I had it adjusted so that anything that would be there is, is going to show up really brightly. But we'll also see it in that in that yellow line because that's a max trace to max okay. power trace. So you'll so definitely see a spike. In we can look away and it'll be there. And I don't have the automatic uh, capture set up right now either. So. But we can let this run if there's other uh, stuff that you need to do for meeting. You were it. I mean, Paul, so, you were cool. it. We appreciate this. This is fascinating to me. And I hope to the rest of you all. And uh, a comment I will make if you have other uh, people you might want to hear from for speakers or other topics, uh, let your board know, i.e. me. Uh, you can also pass it on to Rick Rotrammel, even Jack Jones. Uh, but uh, we'll start looking for speakers for next year. Uh, because you, you can't have them set up too soon. I noticed that uh, one of them I hoped to have speak on the uh, James Webb said, oh, sorry, the calendar's full. Although he had told us months back that he wanted to do it in November. Oh, sorry, I can't do it. I think people are getting tired of Zoom. Although a lot of the entities out there, schools uh, and some of the... Uh, uh, observatories are required to do outreach, and it's part of part of the way that they uh, find people to keep donating money. The more people they get in front of, the better it is. Unlike us, we do outreach because it's fun. So if you want to go to the Kyrene Ray Road uh, Elementary School, three hundred. Screaming kids, they were well behaved last time I was out there. Uh, 
feel free to join us November the 5th, but please let me know so I can let them know how many people we might uh, expect. And if you're interested maybe in, uh, we're, so we're still trying to figure out the Alamo Lake thing. Uh, again, reiterating next weekend, the all Arizona star party is supposed to be decent weather. Might be a little dampness in the sky, but hope not. But it's still better than trying to look through clouds or do your observing from your backyard. Trust me on that. I just spray can of coffee. Coffee gun? Oh, you <laughs> 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 So is most of the information for doing this online or is it like stuff in book get on yes or the white paper? Uh or you just need to know yeah, no, I, I I don't know of the of the white papers. The uh, American Meteor Society, the International Meteor Society, and uh, a couple others have their radio sections. And there's a couple of those that have uh, the international guys, especially. There's a, a group that meets every year over in Europe, and they have very interesting talks. There's a, a paper that they have. If you're interested in the deep scientific and the deep mathematic uh, uh, equations on how everything is working, they, there's a, a book that's about that thick on it. Uh, that was a symposium that they did, I think that was in 2008 or 2010. Uh, I do have references for it if you want, I can get to it. I was having high school flashback slash nightmares when you brought up something talking about geometry. It's like, no. Yeah. Postulate and hypothesis and no. Well, the deep as I like to get into it is angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. That's it. If you're good there, the angle of the angles, never mind. That's it. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a proportional thing. Oh, got another question down here, looks like. Uh, your waterfall is creating constellations. Constellations, yeah. Uh, yeah right now we the, have the. The human eye is a wonderful integrator. I would say it's the llama. If you look at the, uh, this is the tail. This is the back leg, the front leg, and its head up here. I'm looking at, it, at the screen. You can't see it up on here. Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> there, there's something in here that's uh, that's happening. It is. It is. It's because I'm still dilated. And I can see in the dark, like an ocelot or something. Well, we're not seeing very much right now. Yeah, one every what two, three, four minutes when we had it on earlier. Yeah. That was before we even started. We got a question about the sensitivity of that receiver. Mm -hmm. All my background is all analog. Mm -hmm. So you know, I got all my CC numbers. That makes how does that compare? Let's say a good analog receiver. Uh the, the air spy is actually very good on the receiver. Uh the the noise on this, if, if we were to disconnect the antenna, you'd be able to see what the uh, the, the system noise is very low, down 110, 100, minus 110, minus 100. Oh, it's, it's a very good receiver. The, uh, the inexpensive RTL SDRs, um, these are down at about uh, minus 80, minus 90. So they're still very good when compared to the legs. It's quite a difference. Are, are, they, are they very temperature sensitive? Uh, no, these have the temperature compensated crystal inside it, and they actually get warm when you're using it. Well, I'm talking about. I'm not talking about no picture. It's still even more like if the colder will get wider. Uh there no, they actually have a heater in it to, to hold a different constant. So oh, that defeats that purpose. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so we're, we're not gonna do an SPIG cooling on it to, to do that. Yeah. For those of you that are here, the antenna is actually right outside the door. Yeah, we can go look at the antenna. And, uh, just be careful of the cables and uh we'll leave it running until Tom decides to shut it off. You get to entertain them. No problem. I, I have control. 
I'm almost alone now. We can talk. Computer. Now, while they're out looking at the antenna, I'm hoping to see some really massive meteors come through here just to, so I can go na 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 na. But all I'm seeing is some, some background spikes, interference, false meteors. Oh, this one over here was pretty bright. No moving phone cam to follow them outside? No, that's one of the things that your next president will do. Uh, I'm not technically savvy enough uh, to be able to do that. So, uh, although I do, I do have a revolution imager uh, that I could use that camera because it does have a uh, a regular TV type of camera that I could I could could use here. That's something to think about. A little late now, but that's an idea. According to Paul, even this little bright one is not an actual meteor. Although when we were looking at them earlier with him, some of them this bright were showing up and Ah, that's that's interesting. Uh, Jeffrey Sykes in Silver City, about 225 miles east of us here in Phoenix, says he should be able to see uh, Phoenix Channel 3 pings fairly strongly to my west. Interesting. I have to mention that to Paul when he comes back in. I was telling Paul earlier, uh, for those of you who haven't heard this before, when we did the North Rim Star Party, one of the things I was talking about in one of my talks was how uh, the title of it, my talk was how Hubble ruined it for everybody. And I, I mostly talked about uh, things you can do that don't need a telescope for looking at the skies. And one of them was uh, meteorite or meteor hunting with your radio tuning your radio to a certain frequency not used, and then having it uh, basically listen to the static, hoping to hear just what he was talking about it in a very insensitive sort of a system. Uh, I've not had a lot of luck with that. I think I've had it like once or twice uh, when I'm out at the runway there uh, near Salome. Uh, if I'm by myself, I'll just have it set up on top of the vehicle and cranked up just listening to static in the in the vicinity of the frequencies that I should be able to get a meteor if it bounces off the ionosphere. And uh, you can hear another station come in when that happens for maybe you either hear a ping, like they're talking about it, it, it actually is a little ping sounding, or you'll hear just like a second or so of skip from that uh, other station that's coming in from uh, say California or wherever. So it's it's an interesting uh, concept. Most of us are pretty aware of uh, if you've got an older car, especially if you get an AM cooling car uh, and the radio is, you're listening to something in at nighttime, especially, and all of a sudden you're hearing Oklahoma City here in Phoenix.
I'm disappointed. We're not seeing anything basically as much as the, the guys in DC. I used to live not far from DC. Trust me, I don't want to go back there. I used to live in the Eastern Panhandle of West by God, Virginia. And we, this is back in the sixties when I would lay in bed at nighttime in the summer uh, or lay on a cot next to the window, praying for some cool air <laughs> with my shortwave holocrafter uh, radio, listening to WBZ in Boston or Whoa, Whoa, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, some of the Chicago stations are basically listening then into the, uh, uh, the various skip I could get from all around the world uh, with my shortwave system. But now I've got a really nice tech sun uh, shortwave radio and you can't find Doodly Squad on it because nobody's broadcasting in shortwave anymore. We have this thing called the internet. And it's just like, boy, yeah, do so I we, we have lots of going. You know, it could be worse. They're coming back in, so shh, 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 pretend we weren't talking. So the the feet lip is vertically polarized, and you have. Uh, oh, you missed a Paul. It was massive. You should have seen it. Uh, actually, I, actually, I can see on the on the. Uh, oh, that there was the peak. There wasn't anything. Oh, sorry. Damn. I know. You can fool me once. You try to tell them that Haley's comment that came through or Well, let's see, I'm sharing. Let me stop sharing here so we don't have to show everybody what I'm doing. Oh, okay. Um, well, um, Jeffrey Sykes, where you're at, uh, says he's in Silver City, 225 miles east of us. And he said he should be able to see Phoenix Channel 3 pings fairly strongly uh, to my west. Possibly. We have to look and see. Uh, well, when, when the channels change from analog to digital channel three may not actually be on rf channel three uh, it, it may be on something else ah there's no um, correlation between your channel number and the frequency channel. Yeah, yeah no they're 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 completely yeah, different. Yeah, like one, 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 two. yep yep John Kundra uh, asked will there be more after midnight than there is now do you think uh, okay yeah oftentimes there are You have like this is for summarize, we should have more. Should be good. And, but I've also seen lots of it happening midday as well. So things that would otherwise go unobserved, I can observe them uh, with this setup. Well, cool. Quite, inter quite interesting. So if this is here, you can actually pick up some meteor calls that are not visible. Yeah, you said it. yeah. Ten, ten times more invisible than visible. NASA was doing a study back because they were interested in meteors, especially back in the late 50s, early 60s, because they really didn't know what was going to be happening to the guys in the capsules that were going to be sending out of the atmosphere, right? Uh, how much density is there? We know that they're shooting stars. Where do they come from? How many are there? How do we, how do we find all this stuff? <laughs> and they set up a bunch of radars and they set up uh, some static stuff like this. And uh, they had uh, sequenced cameras they were doing at the same time as they got the radio stuff and they were finding it also very difficult because the radio wave uh, has serious spread. Spread. it's one point that it leaves but it's going like this all the time as it gets bigger and bigger so you have path loss uh, for the long distances um, and so you're seeing something that's in this this wide zone and they were trying to correlate their cameras that they had set up at the same time as their or, uh, radars, and that's when they were saying that they were seeing uh, 10 times more on radio than they were on the visual. And they were having a hard time correlating uh, which uh, TV frame it was with which radio thing that they were seeing. And, and I don't know all of them. They also did the satellites with, with long wingspans on them to try to detect, you know, how many. Yeah. We were getting. Yeah, and, and they set up uh, some of the sounding rockets. Yeah, and the sounding rockets they would open up and they had a, a sticky stuff in there. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> and I was reading about that when I was a kid. Yeah, and they would they would uh, then look at the tape and try to figure out uh, you know what it was. So they had clean room uh, thing that would pop over and it would take this and close it back up again. Do you need a broadcast level power on this on your the transmitter like? 
you know, like we were showing your Peter about that powerful yeah. Yeah. broadcast station, that's what the magic was. Right. Uh, yeah, so that's why we're looking at uh, at the high kilowatt uh, versions that I was uh, telling you about. So 45 kilowatts is about uh, 48 kilowatts is as big of a TV signal that I've seen in the lower uh, VHF band. And that, that's all that's left. We used to have. Uh, they used to broadcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do they don't do that anymore. Nope. Well, that's when senior digital stations are on. No, no, no. These are in the. Uh, oh, look. Do they still it's talk about effective radio in public? Yes. Yeah. So we have much lower actual power. Lower actual power. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, let me see if I can find the. Uh, yeah, I remember when they were back in the 50s and 60s, um, they were broadcast blasting <laughs> into the sky. You know? so, yeah. The word, so yeah. Earth is quieting down now. So the EP aren't going to be able to hear us anymore. Yeah. So we're just going to start looking at the more like that noise point. Point of noise. You mean you can't find the noise anymore? there? No. I'll have switch. <laughs> so that I didn't know about Galaxy Quest. The Galaxy, Galaxy Quest shows, um, Lucille Ball. She was one of the in, one of those in, instrumental in getting Star Trek going. Yeah. So yeah. they did they did a they did one of the one of the episodes. Um, I think it was uh, Enterprise. Um, there there was the Vulcans. They crash land on the Earth during the fifties, and one says. Yeah, I love Lucy's on tonight. I want to watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wild. Yeah, it was, you know, it was an expensive show to do. And at NBC would, would only give them so much money, especially the, the last year, you know. Yeah, they're making more off the reruns than they were off the original. Yeah, they, they, they were serious children with the reruns. Okay, so this this is the list right now. I'll put it up on the screen in case anybody's not falling asleep yet. Out, out, out there in participant land watching. Zoom window. Fair screen. Results. Yeah, why NBC's rid of places that show us to still be real. That was more than Jordan Island. That's what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a little busy. So, yeah, so this is uh, one of the list things on the FCC. FCC. You, you can actually go in, actually the go in database. the FCC database, do the, the query by channel. This, so this is channel three, four, and five. So, channel three, uh, I'm looking here. And there is nothing in Phoenix. So your person in Silver City that wanted to look at Channel 3 Phoenix, it's not Channel 3. The RF is somewhere else. Uh, how would you find it? You can look it up by uh, the call sign. So that's probably KTDK. So uh, you could look up the website. They do, but they will also tell you which digital channel it is. So it would be 3.1, 3.2. And your receiver is looking at that, and what the receiver also knows in 3.2 it as actually might be a, a, a UHF frequency. I've got that one around also where also gave the RF. Yeah. Uh, that's, I haven't looked at that in a few years to see my memory's on it. Well, the reference to Gilligan Island, the SS Minnow, somebody did some research on uh, uh, three hours, how far out that boat to get. And couldn't make it. Yeah. It, it would still be in the vicinity. Oh. So that blue thing on the show. I used to watch that show when I was a kid. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. Don't do about that word about it. They heard that TV show they didn't want to play the song because they didn't have a few tickets that they ever And now we use that quite a bit so that we can have our show that we can have our show. Yeah, yeah. So questions from uh, Jeffrey. Yes, I believe channel eight is still on 
VHF eight. Yeah, uh, if that gets a lot higher yet. Uh, they are in the middle of doing a transition as well. Um, and uh, you're welcome. Uh, this was a uh, an interesting presentation for you. I have a lot of fun with it. Thank you. Really, yeah. This was quite interesting. Yes, it was. Okay. So, the rest of you know, next month, the big push. You want to have more good speakers like Paul? Get aboard to run the club so they can find it. I won't be around. I mean, I'll be around, but who wants to hear me anymore? Nobody. Nobody. Get that. No, don't pay attention to the people behind the curtain. They don't know what they talk about. So anyway, what I'm going to do here, thank all of you for hanging around and we're going to gavel ourselves out and well, we're just going to gavel ourselves out. One, two, three, hasta la vista, people.